Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. So we are already into the 10th week of our lectures on nonlinear and adaptive control. And we've already learned several algorithms that will help drive systems such as the SpaceX satellite that we see in the background autonomously. Um, in the previous week, or sorry, in the previous week, of course, we learned the tuning functions method and, and we spent a few weeks on adaptive integrator backstepping based methods. And I am quite certain that a lot of practical systems that uh, all of you would have in mind uh, do fall under the category of um, systems that for which adaptive algorithms can be designed using these methods. So I would strongly encourage all of you to give it a shot and try to formulate your problem and design adaptive controllers for systems using these methods that we have studied. Um, in this in this week, um, we started talking about the robustness issue in adaptive control. We uh, got a pretty fair idea of um, what happens in the absence of disturbance and the fact that any Lyapunov based control design, any strict Lyapunov function based control design to be specific, uh, gives us this very nice uh, disturbance, uh, you know, robustness property. So essentially, what you will get is a convergence uh, to a uh, residual set. It looks something like this picture here and we can also reduce the size of this residual set by you know increasing the control plane right um however we saw that the same does not hold true when an adaptive controller is introduced all right what happens in that case is that you can show that your errors do get into a residual set which is still nice it does look like by changing the control gain, you can, in fact, uh, reduce the size of the residual set. So both of these are, of course, very nice properties that we retain. However, uh, the problem that happens is that uh, this uh, boundedness of E uh, does not actually guarantee the boundedness of H tilde. In fact, it can so happen that once E has entered this nice residual set, um, your V dot becomes non-negative and therefore we can increase and if e cannot increase beyond a certain point and if v has to continue to increase the only possibility is that a tilde keeps increasing and if a tilde increases it means that the parameter errors and the parameter estimates themselves can go to infinity right and since this parameter estimate enters the control expression your control will also become unbounded right and this is one of the most, most undesirable uh, properties of adaptive control. This is uh, one of those reasons which really restricted the growth of adaptive control uh, in the 80s, yeah, and, and 90s, of course. And so what we want to know is how to get rid of this uh, explosion of parameter value issue. Now, uh, one of the things that's sort of an obvious, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, answer or obvious solution to this problem is that if you know some bounds on your parameters value, parameter values, you want to make sure that you search only within these bounds. Therefore, your estimates just evolve in between these bounds. And the process of doing this kind of an adaptation is called parameter projection in adaptive control. All right. So again, there are several ways of doing parameter projection in adaptive control, and, and we will focus on one particular way right now, uh, and that's where we start today. So let me uh, mark this as lecture 10.3. In fact, I want to see that I marked last time. 
I will mark here, but I forgot to mark last time. So I am going to mark this as lecture 10.2. And today we are at lecture 10.3. Yeah. So what is parameter projection? What we are looking at is called smooth projection, right? There is also a non-smooth version. Yeah. Uh, which we are not looking at right now, but yes, a non-smooth version also exists. Uh, so we are looking at smooth projection. This ensures that uh, the parameters remain bounded uh, within pre-specified parameter bounds. These bounds, a min and a max, have to be provided by the you know end user. Yeah, so it's expected that the end user does have some knowledge of these unknown parameters, right? And once we ensure using some smooth projection algorithm that your uh, parameter estimates remain bounded, then the control itself also remains bounded. All right, excellent. So, as usual, what we do is we look at this uh, dynamical system x dot is ax plus u, where a is unknown. And what we want to do as always is to track a reference trajectory which is nice smooth bounded infinity differentiable and all that nice stuff all right um so then we compute the dynamics of e dot which is just ax plus u minus r dot we sort of do a little bit of reshuffling of terms and the uh, you know introduce the nice negative k term here and add the k term here and this entire quantity, which is a known quantity, because I will specify the control, is now denoted as V. Yeah. So this entire thing is denoted as a new term V or a new control V, if you may. Now, how we implement projection is using tan hyperbolic functions. Okay. So how do we do that? Uh, the unknown quantity A we claim can always be written as this sort of an expression okay that is it is a min plus one half a max minus a min one minus tan hyperbolic phi star okay now what we want to do or what we are desired to uh, what we are going to do is to move from looking at a as the parameter to looking at phi star as the parameter Okay, so if you see this expression on the right hand side, the only unknown is the phi star, right? And the left hand side is, of course, the unknown a. So, what we have done is we've moved the unknown a to an unknown phi star, which is inside a tan hyperbolic function. Now, let's look at why this is uh, making sense. Yeah, the first thing is that the tan hyperbolic function varies from minus one to one for all real numbers okay what does it mean it means that this quantity lies between uh, 0 to 2 okay 0 to 2 so what happens at 0 uh, at 0 you have the right hand side a as equal to a min and when you are at 2, you get a equals a max. And this is rather easy to verify, right? You put 0 here, you just have a min. If you put 2 here, this gets cancelled with this, and this gets cancelled with this. And you are left with a max. All right. So essentially, what does it mean? It means that at, uh, you know, at one edge of the spectra, yeah, at one edge, phi, uh, you know, at one end, uh, when phi star, tan phi star, tan s hyperbolic phi star takes value one, you have a min as the value of a, and uh, when tan hyperbolic phi star takes the value minus one, you have a is a max, right? Therefore, by scanning phi star, right? So the phi star is of course belonging to all of real numbers. So just by scanning in all of real numbers, I go only between a min to a max, right? So this is what is projection, all right? So because if you notice, if I make a picture, something like this, um, so the phi star, yeah, is 
Yeah, the five star is sort of yeah, so the five star is ranging from all of yeah, all of real numbers. So this is where is five star, and this is ranging from a min a max. This is where is a. All right. So even though I vary five star from minus infinity to infinity, yeah, I'm going to remain only within a min and a max. Okay, so this is the projection, right? This is this is the projection. I hope you understand. So this is the smooth projection using this tan hyperbolic function. The five star ranges from minus infinity to infinity. That is my search domain. But once I do the projection, it is actually finding uh, true value of parameters only between a min and a max. And notice that this a is what you know gets implemented or a hat is what gets implemented. So you never have to worry about what the value of phi star is because once it's plugged inside the tan hyperbolic, it ranges between minus one to one. So you get a bounded quantity between a min and a max here, the right hand side. Okay, excellent. So tan hyperbolic z lies between minus one to one. It is zero, exactly zero, if and only if z is zero. So and type of tan hyperbolic z is actually this expression. Yeah, if you so if you see uh, when do you get tan hyperbolic equal to uh, one is when uh, let's see you'll get tan hyperbolic equal to one when uh, you have z going to infinity, right? when you have z going to infinity and you will get it as minus one when you have z going to minus infinity then because in that when z goes to infinity these two are zero so these two become one and when z goes to minus infinity these two are minus one yeah and uh, so these two are zero so this becomes minus one all right now what happens at z equal to zero the numerator is zero so therefore you know you get a zero so the picture of the uh, you know of the tan hyperbolic function if you may looks something like this right. so the tan hyperbolic function sorry so this is So, the, so this is basically 1 and minus 1 and the tan hyperbolic function uh, looks something like looks something like this all right so the tan hyperbolic function looks something like Yeah, okay. I hope that makes sense. So this is essentially the projection. Okay, so this is the key part here. So remember, the phi, the phi star being the parameter that we are trying will try to identify. Um, actually, re helps us to do projection because we adapt for phi star. So we create a phi hat. All right, but then we implement a hat in the controller right not a uh, not phi hat right so the control always contains the a hat and that's all we care about okay so let's look at the adaptive problem so this is the definition of a it should not be difficult to see that if a does lie between a min and a max there exists such a phi star yeah because uh, this tan hyperbolic takes every value from minus one to one so obviously you cannot miss a yeah so there does exist a phi star such that uh, a satisfies this expression okay. right 
So before we move on, uh, so this was becomes a dynamics, right? This becomes a dynamics because you've redefined the control. Okay. Um, so before we move on, we define some filtered variables. All right. So there is a very particular unique value to these filtered variables. This is uh, follows and I mean falls under the purview of what is called non certainty equivalence. Yeah, you will see why very soon. You will see why very soon. Yeah, but before that, we define these filtered variables. It is not very uncommon. Uh, Slotin also used these filter variables a long time ago, but here the purpose is different. Okay, so what do we do? We look at the dynamics. How do we create filtered variables? Is the important question. What do we create filtered variables for? Is the important question. We create filtered variables of all the terms we, all the known terms on the right hand side. So the known terms are E, V, and X, right? So A is the unknown. So we create filtered variables of E, V, and X because all three are known quantities. Because it doesn't make any sense to filter unknown quantities since uh, these filtered quantities will get uh, used in actual control implementation and you know, you can't if you don't know that, all right? So you cannot filter a quantity which is unknown, right? So therefore I create a filter for E, v and x and the filters are very straightforward it's a standard low pass type filter basically it is like ef dot is minus beta ef plus e for the same beta you create three filters vf dot is minus beta vf plus v xf dot is minus beta xf plus x and the initial conditions are chosen to be arbitrary we don't worry about we don't have to worry about what the initial conditions are now what do we do i want to sort of establish a um, relationship between the original variables and their dynamics which is this and the filtered variables and their dynamics all right in order to do this what i do is i take this first equation and i take a derivative on both sides right so that's it i take the first equation and i've taken derivative on both sides so on the left hand side i get a second derivative of ef so ef double dot and on the right hand side, I get minus beta e of dot plus e dot. And I get an e dot. Why did I take the derivative of this term only? Because it brings in the e dot. Right? And once I have the e dot, I can substitute from here. Right? And that's what is happening. Right? This is essentially that e of double dot is minus beta e of dot plus e dot. So this is the entire thing is plus e dot. Okay. Great. So once I have these, what I want to do is I want to write everything in terms of the filtered quantities, right? So I want to write E in terms of filtered quantities, V in terms of filtered quantities, and X in terms of the filtered quantities, right? So what do I know? I know that uh, E is EF dot plus beta EF V is vf dot plus beta vf and x is uh, xf dot plus beta xf and this is what we substitute here here so e is written as ef dot plus beta ef v is written as vf dot plus beta vf x is written as xf dot plus beta xf all right then what i do is I take um, the higher derivatives on one side. So EF double dot was already on the left hand side. Okay. EF dot was already on the left hand side. And then uh, the VF dot plus AXF dot is taken here. Right. And then KEF dot is also taken here. Okay. So basically, or, or to put it simply, all the beta terms, beta containing terms, are kept on the right hand side and all the rest of the terms are brought to the left hand side okay so all the terms on the right hand side are scaled by beta which is ef dot from here uh, efk from here vf from here and axf from here okay I'm just checking if the signs are correct 
minus beta EF. Uh, I'm just checking if the signs are correct. I'm starting. I'm not sure. Let's see. EF double dot plus KEF dot plus VF dot plus AXF dot. Okay. And on the right hand side, I have <coughs> beta KEF sure minus. minus beta vf correct plus axf so this is not correct doesn't seem correct and this sign doesn't seem correct yeah this sign doesn't seem correct i need to verify this so beta ef dot is same minus a ef dot plus beta ef plus vf dot plus beta vf plus a xf dot plus beta xf all this is good then what goes to the left side right? vf double dot plus k ef dot minus vf dot minus a x dot all right great then what do i have is minus beta okay ef dot plus k ef minus vf minus a x f so this sorry sorry so this was correct yeah, this was correct okay great so this is fine so now what you notice is something rather interesting so this expression is correct absolutely right all i've done is in this guy right here i've taken the terms with the beta on the right hand side and the terms without the beta scaling on the left hand side that's all all right um now if you look at this very carefully and i choose sigma to be whatever is in the bracket here that is ef dot plus kef minus vf plus x axf if i do that i notice that the left hand side is just sigma dot okay so the so the equation that we get is that sigma dot is minus beta sigma and what do we know from here it means that sigma is exponentially decaying right which implies not just sigma goes to zero it implies that sigma t equals sigma zero to the power minus beta t all right so this is rather cool essentially means that this quantity sigma is going to zero as t goes to infinity now it's very well known in control that the exponentially decaying terms do not affect the stability all right so we can ignore the sigma equal to sigma zero e to the power minus p30 type of term in this equation so what we know is that we can just assign this to zero we can simply assign this to zero because this is simply an exponentially decaying term that can be ignored i mean i can very be very careful and write this as sigma zero e minus beta t but that's not required it doesn't affect our stability analysis at all all right and that's the key point so we ignore this term so which means we put this to zero and if you do put this to zero you will notice that you will get the equation from here as ef dot is minus kef plus vf plus axf now notice uh, very carefully i'm going to make this smaller so we can see both of them together if you look at this equation i apologize look at this equation and this equation simultaneously you notice that they look exactly the same modulo the filtered variables in place of the original variables all right so this is very very critical yeah so this original dynamics and the filtered dynamics are precisely the same except for the filtered variables appearing in place of the original variables and this is what is the magic of this kind of a filter construction all right so this this sort of a nice neat outcome happened because of the filter construction and you want these to have the same structure all right you want these to have the same structure and so what we do is now in this filtered state we prescribe our control yeah notice that this is already a stable system so all i want to do is sort of get rid of this yeah but the problem is i don't know a so i cannot really implement a so i implement an a hat okay now a hat is just a placeholder 
which means it's just a symbol yeah to define this guy yeah now this is where your non certainty equivalence becomes very apparent so i'm going to mark this as non certainty equivalence okay so you see that the expression is very identical to what we had for the original system or for the actual a if you see the actual a expression is something like this a max minus a min by 2 y minus tan hyperbolic phi star plus a so that's the expression plus a min so in place of this thing we have tan hyperbolic phi hat plus delta hat okay so in general you expect that phi will get phi star will get replaced just by a single phi hat but it doesn't in this case it is replaced by a phi hat and also by a delta hat so two terms okay not two estimates or anything but just two different terms all right and this is what makes it non certainty equivalence so it's not exactly following certainty equivalence principle but the idea is that the overall expression is exactly the same yeah whatever be phi hat plus delta hat this a hat is going to lie between um so a hat is definitely going to lie between a max a min and a max this is guaranteed yeah by virtue of the property of the tan hyperbolic that it lies between minus 1 to 1 irrespective of what the argument is all right so you are bound to lie between a min and a max and this is what we want and this is essentially projection okay although we are trying we are going to try to update phi hat that is whatever is inside between in, in all of real numbers so there's no bound on that but what we do can do is we create a bound or what we want to do is create a bound on a hat and we do have it okay whatever be phi hat and delta hat which you use specify subsequently yeah your estimate a hat the uh, given by this formula and which is what actually shows up in the control is bounded yeah so it doesn't happen it doesn't matter what happens to v v dot negative definite positive definite and all that as soon as i have this kind of an expression i'm guaranteed to have vf to be bounded yeah and if vf is bounded it's not difficult to see that v will also be bounded because vf is just v is just vf dot plus beta vf okay so everything is going to be nice and bounded just like you want it you will not get unbounded controls and so on and so forth all right except except so what did we talk about today we uh, sort of started talking about the parameter projection method uh, for adaptive control so what it entails is uh, first of all of course knowledge of uh, bound and secondly a, we try to do what is called smooth projection and this smooth projection is really implemented using uh, tan hyperbolic functions which are essentially saturation functions of a kind and lie between minus 1 to 1 for all possible value of the arguments therefore we redefine our parameter in terms of tan hyperbolic of a argument of a estimate phi yeah and this phi is what we try to estimate later on so we we actually propose an update law for phi hat okay and because of this what happens is that your uh, actual estimate a hat that enters the control law remains bounded yeah due to this projection and therefore robustness issue is completely resolved uh, because this is what happens when you introduce a disturbance that the parameters start to fluctuate or can start to grow really large and unbounded but in this case it is simply impossible because we are guaranteeing by construction that uh, a hat remains bounded all right so uh, all of this is of course implemented using filtered variables and uh, version of non certainty equivalence and so in the subsequent sessions we will see how this non certainty equivalence method gets implemented and how uh, you do the how do you do the lyapunov analysis for this all right so i hope you enjoyed this session and i definitely hope to see you all in the next one thank you